that. Okay. Actually, I think restoring public trust is a huge part of my job right now. And people who know me know that integrity is extremely important to me. And coming into a role like this, I mean, you you know, there there's a track record and people do wonder about what this means for me. But what I'm hoping is that through my perspective as a teacher, a parent, principal, and serving as the chief ed officer for the past few years, I hope people see that as a person that has perspective and a stake in this district. And there are a lot of things and priorities that we can talk about, but one of my top priorities is working to restore public trust in Chicago public schools. It's leadership. I think people love their schools and love their principals and teachers, but I want them to have a more positive um, you know, perception of the district throughout the city. How do you think you do that? I think it starts with open communication and more transparency. I think that the one thing about people in general, they will give you the benefit of the doubt. I believe that. I think it starts with these community meetings that I talked about in my launch letter. And these are things that are already hallmarks of how I operate and lead. But one of the first things that I'd like to do is kind of go out neighborhood by neighborhood and hear the concerns. And I've done that over the past few years through like town halls and roundtable discussions. Obviously, I need to do more of those now that I'm in this role. But what I imagine I'm going to find out in that process is that there are some needs that are similar throughout the district that people are concerned about. Everyone wants a high quality education for their child. And then there are needs that are unique to every community. And in order for me to do a good job, I have to talk to people and really have a pulse of what communities need and what people are concerned about. How are you going to manage the money situation of the district? I mean, you're like obviously yeah. the education expert, which yeah. we haven't had for a long time here. Yeah. Um, but the finances are just super complicated and it's sort of still not. Yeah, I've always said that the, the, it takes a, a, a team of people to run Chicago public schools. I don't think that there's one superhuman person who can manage all, you know, the complexities here. But I think people want a CEO who is an educator. They want a superintendent type running the school system. We haven't had that in a while in Chicago public schools. And I think that the response has been great. With that said, we do have a financial situation that has to be managed. I think we have to continue to be disciplined in our policies. There, there have been a lot of changes that I think are positive and good for the district. The infusion of cash from Springfield obviously helps, and that's something that I know principals and teachers and parents appreciate because this year has been a year that has been calm. You know, we haven't worried about mid-year cuts and furlough days and teachers not having professional development time. I mean, all the things that we know matter are in place. And I think as I enter this role as an educator, I understand that you have to have a strong fiscal footing in order to provide a high quality education. And I wanna keep some of those efficiencies in place so that people have what they need at the school level. That has to be the primary focus. Do you have that team in place yet? We're working on that team. We obviously have um, a chief financial officer who's been working and senior vice president leading the district. Um, but in the coming weeks, I will be announcing, you know, the team that's going to be helping to lead the district. I think everyone wants to know who's going to be in place, and I look forward to sharing that information. Who's the CFO? Currently, we have Jenny Bennett as oh, our yeah. CFO okay. and Ron Denard as the senior vice president. Ron's well, got a deadline now. He does. To sell his house or to find a job. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what she's going to do? I don't have any new information at this time. Okay. Um, what, just really quickly with the money stuff, the, um, you know, everybody rushed to pay their property taxes, mm -hmm. thinking it's going to help them with their federal taxes. Yeah. So you're going to get $220 million yeah. faster Soon. than yeah. you thought. What is that going to do for the district? I think it helps us with the cash flow issues. I mean, we've talked a lot about the finances in the district, and I think we spent a lot of time focused on kind of the budgetary part of that. Um, but from uh, a cash flow, this actually helps us. We anticipate those funds coming in earlier, and so it just uh, you know allows us to keep managing the district and not kind of waiting for payments at a particular time. So it just strengthens the financial situation for the district. Do you have a sense of how much money that's going to save the district in like short-term borrowing? I don't have those numbers now, but we can follow up and get the exact information. But like later today? Yeah, I can have Michael uh, take a look Please. at it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, how would you describe your relationship with the Board of Ed? I think, I think I have a strong relationship with our Board of Education. I mean, I, in my role as Chief Ed Officer, spent a lot of time working with them. Um, I, one of the things that will continue to be a, uh, the way that I operate is to provide them with the information that they need so that they can make decisions on behalf of the students and families here in Chicago Public Schools. 
our board, I mean, people don't get to see this all the time. Obviously, at board meetings, they are formatted a certain way. But they have a lot of questions about uh, management decisions and policies that we bring forth. And one of the things that I want to do in my role is to continue to strengthen that relationship and be as transparent as possible, providing them with information so that when they vote on decisions, they know exactly what we're asking them to do, what the implications are for the people that we serve. And, and I think that the board appreciates that because they do a tremendous job serving in this role. They're not paid to do it. They do it because they care about public education. And so it's my job to make sure that they have all the information that they need to make good decisions. How about the CTU? The CTU? I think I have a good relationship with them. I mean, they've gone on record about the fact that they are happy that there's an educator in this role and that, you know, I have a stake in the district. I think we agree on the thing that's most important, which is that kids deserve great schools. I worked as a principal and a teacher. I believe I don't believe in just giving people enough to get by. Our schools, they need to have resources so that they can be successful. I would imagine there are going to be things that we disagree on. Um, we want the same things, things for children, but we're going to disagree on how to get there. But one of the things that I want to do during my administration is to make sure we keep the lines of communication open. Um, during the strike negotiations and other things like that where I've had to have those kind of conversations with the union, I think one of the things that made the difference is that the lines of communication were always open. And I want to continue that, you know, while we have labor peace, for lack of a better phrase. Mm -hmm. My personal opinion is that the office of the OIG has to exist. Again, if we want people to trust the district, they have to know that there is a place where, you know, people, you know, where they, they can trust what's happening in the district. The report comes out every year. I think it's, um, we, we saw some of the um, information in there that, you know, as a leader now of this district, I'm not pleased with. But I think that we have a good relationship, and I want to, again, have the same level of transparency and the inappropriate level of communication. It's obviously a little bit different. Um, so that he can do his job, but also so that I can do my job. And what I want people to know is that this is a large district. I'm not making any excuses, but I want to be judged on how we act when, when there are bad actors in our district. And when things are brought to our attention, how do we hold individuals accountable, but also how do we ensure that we have the right policies and systems or conditions in place so that these things don't continue to happen. And so with his recent report, one of the things we want to do is just look at some of the recommendations that are in there, look at some of the um, you know revisions that he's proposing, and keep, again, that open discussion going. I don't see, I, I see us having a good relationship so that he can do his job and I can do mine. Do you believe him? Do I believe him on what? The inspector general. I think he's an honest person. Okay. What is your high school plan? <laughs> I think when you when we when we talk about the high school plan, I'm always going to start with the education plan, like what happens in classrooms. And I think I've talked a lot about expanding proven programs like the International Baccalaureate Program. And the reason that that's important. Just yesterday, I had a conversation with a parent who was talking about options in the district. And everybody thinks selective enrollment is the only option. And there are so many programs that are proven, like IB, like STEM, that really help students get a great high school experience, but also go off to college and persist and be successful and eventually graduate. So the first step is like paying attention to the programs and what's actually happening in the classrooms in our high schools. I think that's the first step. Um, as chief ed officer, we did walkthroughs. We did, um, we call them instructional core walks of every single high school in the district, and we have a regular cadence of that. So just figuring out where schools are, what resources or programs they need in order to get to the next level, that's kind of the first step. I think the second piece is this access piece, and we started that work with Go CPS, mm -hmm. um, helping parents understand the process. I think the district has done a really great job with high school to college transition. But the place where we had to spend more time was on the eighth grade to high school transition. Because whether people believe it or not, that's a really important decision. The high school that you attend really sets you up for success later in life. And so we saw an equity issue in that some parents are really well versed and know how to navigate the system, while other parents had struggled with that. But I was happy to report that over 90% of our kids participated, um, rising eighth graders, I'm sorry, rising ninth graders participated in that process this year, and our original goal was 75%. 
Um, so now the next phase is selection, and we want to make sure that parents have um, confidence in that process. And so, you know, the second phase of communication is around making sure people understand how the algorithm will work and what the process is. But at the end of the day, it's about parents exercising choice and them understanding, you know, the quality of the high school and what that means for their child going forward. Yeah, and the schools that nobody picks, I mean, you got to talk about closings too. We have to talk about we have to talk about those schools. But what I want to make sure people understand is that there there's no plan for sweeping closings throughout the district. I think the district and the city experienced that, and the you know the his, history is there on that. But there is an issue, and you know we've started to address this already with plans like the Inglewood plan. We do have to look neighborhood by neighborhood. I think the easy answer is to approach this in you know kind of a big bang approach, but it doesn't work like that. These problems are unique to every community, and what I find, I can be in one, on one side of town, and people are talking about overcrowding or the need for another school, and I can be on another side of town where people are concerned about lack of programming or variety or um, underutilized schools and so we have to find the right balance one of the things that I've tried to do um, and I want to make sure people uh, notice this is engage the community more again people won't always agree with the approach these are hard decisions and they act they impact real people okay but we have to do something about it when I look at a community like Inglewood you have four um, schools where 89% of the school-age children have decided that they need a different option. And as a district, we have a decision to make if we continue to allow that to happen and not try. And the district has tried. We've invested in those schools. We've done so many different things. But we have to, we have to infuse something new that attracts people back to their schools. Mm -hmm. I think everybody deserves to walk out of their door and you know have an opportunity or see something that's an opportunity for their child. And if you look at Inglewood, where 89% of the high school age children are choosing to go somewhere else, that means that majority of the people in the community don't feel like that option is there. It's probably not always, that's not going to always be the approach. Sometimes the approach will be adding a program. You know, should we uh, create more IB options in um, particular neighborhoods? Should we, in, you know, double down on some of the programs like, you know, we may have a middle years program at a school. Should we expand that? It's going to be unique in community by community, but mm -hmm. people should not expect widespread school closings. That's not my approach. I want to go neighborhood by neighborhood. How many schools does DCIC need? I think I don't have a number of how many schools we need. I mean, it's been widely published that we have um, in excess of over 100,000 seats. That doesn't necessarily mean you just do a quick, you know, uh, addition or division problem and come up with a number, there are communities, and I've said this before, where the district has um, an interest in that school being successful. Hirsch would be a perfect example. We want that neighborhood high school open. That community needs a neighborhood high school. And so it's not as easy as looking at the number of seats and coming up with a particular number of schools. Some communities have to have an open enrollment high school for students to attend, and the district has to take an approach that seeks to improve those schools. It just seems like there hasn't been a plan. I mean, I've been doing this now for more than five years. Mm -hmm. There is no plan mm -hmm. for demographics, for capital, yeah. for an all-encompassing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard yeah. you say you want to be in this for the long haul. Yeah. What's it going to take for you to put, you know, to come up with a plan? This is what I want to do first. I think if we come, there are a bunch of smart people here in CPS. We can come up with a plan and put it out, and you know what will happen when we do that. The thing that I want to do, and I want the public support in doing this, when we start those conversations going community by community, it's not just me coming out to listen and you know what those meetings look like. We have to start with uh, what's the current state so we can drive the conversation around what's the desired state. Questions like, do we have enough quality schools in this community? Do we have enough quality programming? Are the students um, who reside in the community choosing these schools? Mm -hmm. I want to start just kind of like an education tour around what's happening. There are some areas where the demographics are shifting so dramatically that we need to have a discussion around that. I don't think the you know the average person walking around knows that. Um, when I talk about certain schools, I go to communities and we, we talk about schools and I tell them how many kids are in there. They don't know this. And so that type of information is probably the start. And it's my... Um, my, my assumption is that if we do that, a lot will come out of that. You know, people debate back and forth about what happens in Inglewood, but people are taking, they're taking their destiny into their own hands. They see what's happening. They see that 
a large share of people are choosing to move outside the community, and nobody wants that. We can point to other places where, like North Lawndale, Bronzeville, places where community groups Pilsen. People are sitting down, putting together their own plans, and coming to CPS and saying, we think that this is a good idea. And I think that that's been a good approach, but we need something that's more systematic. And so these neighborhood meetings that I'm talking about, we will be going around and we will be starting with the baseline. What is currently happening? What are, uh, what are the options? Are people choosing? Are these schools quality based on our school quality rating policy? And that's going to start the discussion. So I think that's going to help us create the plan that is needed.